The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. You take good Good morning, church. I hope you're having a blessed day. We had a powerful lesson yesterday, a very direct, a very, um, it was just a very powerful lesson. If you ain't got a chance to watch it, you need to go back and watch what we taught yesterday on division. And as, as strong as I taught yesterday, I felt like it was only fitting that we take a day to kind of sit back. I want to relax. I want to give you a nice, warm message. You know, something that's easy to take in today. So today we're going to talk about Revelation chapter 15. <laughs> and I just, I laugh so much at that because what we're going to talk about today, after, especially coming after a lesson yesterday, you're like, man, we're going into the book of the Revelation. It's, we, we already had a strong teaching yesterday. Today's going to be even stronger. Well, actually, I, I want to take just a minute and talk about this because we're going to talk about the Song of Moses. That's what we're actually going to be talking about today, the Song of Moses. But I want, I want to explain something about the book of the Revelation. This is something that's been coming up recently a lot and things that I see on uh, social media and, and I hear from people as they talk is a wrong understanding of Revelation chapter 15 or just the book of the Revelation in general. And what I mean by that is if you take our end times curriculum or our end times curriculum part two, if you take either one of those, if you go into the introduction, which our introduction is on YouTube, so you can always go and watch it there also. But we have a full length class in the introduction where we go through what we call a purpose and a perspective, which means we go through the reasons why we're teaching the class and some viewpoints that we take before we actually teach through the class. And one of the main things we talk about is the book of the Revelation is the revelation of the man Christ Jesus. So we, we never want to lose focus of the book in general from the very start. That this book, as you read it, should reveal the man Christ Jesus to you more and more. And it does have events. The book is definitely focused. It's got a it's got most I believe it's got the most amount of information dealing with the end times in the book of the Revelation. You know, you could compare it to the book of Isaiah, and Isaiah might have a little more details, but I believe the book of the Revelation is the most concise and cohesive book when it comes to end time prophecy. But the reason why I say all of those things is that Revelation 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is all about perspective. Looking at the man Christ Jesus revealing his nature and his character to you more and more before you even really get into the unfolding of the events. And even through the events, what you see is the glory of God. And what I'm going to talk about today for just a minute is one of the greatest places in the book of the Revelation when it comes to revealing the nature of this man. And what I mean by that is if you study through the book of the Revelation and you study it correctly, the book of the Revelation is a love story. It's a love story. And if you don't read it with that perspective, then you'll never really truly understand the glory of what's taking place inside of the events. So let me let me explain this for just a second, then we're going to jump into the lesson. You have the Antichrist kingdom, you know, the harlot Babylon leading into the Antichrist kingdom. On the other side of it, you have the church, God's chosen, God's people. So you have God's people, and you have the Antichrist kingdom. And you have the nation of Israel in the middle of all of it. But this is just something I want you to see. God's people, 
the church and the nation of Israel and the Antichrist kingdom are at, at a conflict, at a crossroads. The Antichrist is trying to kill believers, people that will not worship him. And throughout this process, people will be taking the mark of the beast. And through that, the Antichrist is going to be bringing desolation across the whole earth against the people that don't take the mark. But then God will be bringing forth desolation against the people that do take the mark. So that's why we've, we've already talked about the abomination of desolation. And this widespread desolation happening in two ways. The Antichrist rage and the judgments of God. But in this whole process, what takes place is the man Christ Jesus comes back to the earth to his people. So I want you to think for a second. Every love story you've ever seen, if you've ever seen somebody, the main character, at conflict with something else, and then this man on a on a horse, this this valiant uh, you know cowboy. Let's say you know he comes in on a horse. He's a cowboy. He rushes in and he saves the woman. You know he 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 grabs his bride and takes her away and destroys the destroys the uh, the invading army or whatever it is. That type of love story. That's what the book of the Revelation is. It's the man Christ Jesus coming back for his bride. And he's going to destroy all of the armies of the wicked. This, this book is a love story. And if you read it correctly, you will fall more and more in love with the man Christ Jesus. Because the judgments of God that are poured out are not poured out against God's people. People read the book of the Revelation as God coming against his church. No, it's the man Christ Jesus coming against the Antichrist. And he will destroy the Antichrist in his kingdom. He will eventually throw the devil, the Antichrist, the false prophets, and everybody that stands with them into the lake of fire for all of eternity. This period of time will only be once. And once it's happened and once it's over, it will never be like that anymore. That's what the Bible declares. So I really encourage you in that to... Read the book of the Revelation as you are the bride that the Father has prepared for His Son and He's coming for us. And, he's, and His judgments are against the thing that's oppressing you. That's why the church actually prays in. It's, it's the prayer and, worship muse, uh, prayer and worship movement. It's the harp and the bowl that actually brings forth the judgments of God. The, the judgments are of God are released in conjunction with the praying church. And I want to talk about that. So let's go into Revelation 15. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump right into it. I know I kind of gave you a kind of a long introduction into this lesson, but I just want you to read it appropriately, you know, especially after coming off a lesson yesterday. And if you didn't get a chance, I encourage you to watch our lesson on division. That, that lesson is powerful. It's delivering. Now, if you are self-centered, if you're ignorant, if you're prideful, you'll probably get offended. That's fair warning. You'll probably be getting offended because it is a direct contradicting, and I am directly coming against the pride, the self-centeredness that's in your heart because I want to deliver you from the oppression of the enemy, and I want you to walk in the glorious light of what Jesus has ordained for you. And I want you to step into the full identity and receive everything that God has ordained for your life. The fivefold ministry is about growing you up to look more like Christ Jesus. And that's what that lesson is all about, is to take you from a lower level of identity and bring you into the, the, the identity that Jesus paid for. It's, probably, it's, gonna, it's gonna hurt your pride, and I hope it does. That's the sword of the Spirit is used to split asunder spirit and soul. Separate the two so that you will live by the Spirit and make your soul or your mind, will, and emotions submit to the Spirit of God. I'm getting way off track, but I think all of these truths need to be said, so we're just going to continue to go as the Spirit of God leads me. But go with me to Revelation chapter 15. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the Word become wisdom revelation in the knowledge of your Son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion, transforming us by the renewing of our mind, conforming us to the image of Christ, growing us up in the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. 
Well, go with me to Revelation chapter 15. It's only eight verses, so we're just going to go ahead and read all eight verses. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways. Thou King of saints, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled." Now that's a very strong passage right there, and just as a quick uh, introduction, if you've never studied through the book of the Revelation, the book of the Revelation has what we call chronological sections, meaning the events are unfolding one after another. And don't be deceived by the people that relegate all this stuff to something past, something already been done. Listen, the book of the Revelation and the events outlined in the book of the Revelation are yet future. So they are coming later on down the road. That's why we study them so we can be prepared. But they are what we call chronological sections, where the events unfold one after another. And then you have what we call parentheticals, or angelic explanations, where the message is, the, the storyline is put on pause, and, an, and the angel explains to the Apostle John why the events are taking place as they were. So when we study Revelation, Revelation 10 and 11 is a chronological section. That's our, our the first part of uh, the, fir the, uh, the, the last half of 11. My apologies. I'm trying to make sure I get the numbers right. You can take our end times curriculum, which starts in part, part two, which starts in October, which is verse by verse through the entire book. I'm just kind of summarizing it real quick. But the chronological section gets, on pause, gets put on pause. And Revelation 12, 13, 14 is an angelic explanation. And if you read Revelation 12, 13, 14, that is where you see a full explanation of the beast, the, anti, uh, the, the false prophet, and the devil, the dragon. And then you also see the revelation of the woman and her, uh, and her child, which is the lamb, the son of God, the deliverer of the world. But when you read the book of the Revelation, who is called the beast is the Antichrist. The Antichrist is the beast. And he's called the beast because he will have no mercy. There will be nothing inside of him that is less than a beast. A wild beast with rage and terror and anger and fierceness. You'll never be able to have diplomacy with this man. This man is a beast in every aspect of his nature and his character. You'll never be able to reason with him. And it says that after the angelic explanation is finished, the storyline gets opened up again. And the very next thing you see after the seven trumpets are blown is the church and God's people. I believe at the seventh trumpet, the church is raptured. You go to heaven, you're with the Lord. But then it shows all of God's people on the sea of glass and they have harps. And then they cry out what it says, the song of Moses. Them that did not partake with the beast, which means you didn't get the mark of the beast. You didn't participate in Antichrist worship. You weren't a part of any of that. You stood for the Lord, faithful and true, until the very end. And then God brings all of his people together. 
You stand before the Lord on the sea of glass and you have harps and you sing the song of Moses. That's so powerful. You sing the song of Moses. And then the next thing that you see is the, the seven angels come out of the temple and they have the seven plagues of God. And then a, a cloud or the smoke, the glory of God fills this temple until the plagues are released all the way. So what I want you to understand is that first and foremost, the church will be here until the seventh trumpet. I, I'm, 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 I'm very confident in that. And, he, and here's something we've always said that if you prepare to leave, and if you, if you believe that you're going to leave at any moment, and you're not going to ever experience the great tribulation, you'll never study the book of the Revelation. You'll never study end time prophecy. Because if I'm not here, why does it matter? Well, God put it in the book 2,000 years ago to equip his church. But if you are prepared to be here until the last trumpet, and you go through the tribulation, those are the people that have understanding. Those are the people that are prepared. So if it's one or the other, I would rather be prepared because if we do go up early, I've always made this statement, if, you, if there is a pre-tribulation rapture and you go up and you never experience the great tribulation, glory, hallelujah, I'll concede, you are right, we'll be with the Lord, it won't matter. But if we're here on the earth and we go through it, you're gonna be looking at me wondering, I don't understand what's going on, and that's the problem. Those are the people that will be easily in fear and deceived, and deception leads to offense, and offense leads to people falling away from the Lord. And you don't want to have that happen to you. But this is a glorious moment in the storyline in Revelation chapter 15, where the people of God stand before God on the sea of glass with hearts, and they cry out the song of Moses. You cry out the song of Moses and, and the seven angels prepare to pour out the seven vials. And we're not going to talk about the rapture today to explain why I believe we're not going to be here during that time. But I don't believe the church is going to be here when the seven vials are poured out. One quick understanding is that the vials are poured out against the whole earth. Where when the trumpets blow, they are only blown against part of the earth which shows the fact that there is always deliverance for the people of God. And when God's going to judge the entire world, God takes his people out of that. Remember, the book of the Revelation is not mostly about, you know, judgments on God's people. That's what most people think. If you ask a random person on the street, they'll say, what is the book of the Revelation mostly about? They'll say, God's judgments against people. Well, no, it's God's judgments against the, against the Antichrist kingdom. God is coming against the people that oppress God's people, not against God's people. There's a little, like I believe it's like three verses that deal with the fact God's people will be persecuted. But other than that, all of the judgments, none of them are against God's people. They're all against the Antichrist. And that's the, that's the understanding we're trying to build as we study end time prophecy to make sure that we equip God's people to not be in fear, not be scared. There's nothing to be afraid of when it comes to end time prophecy. And if you're here through the great tribulation, there's nothing to be afraid of. It will be one of the most glorious hours in human history where the people of God will walk in purity and holiness and extreme power in the Holy Ghost. It's gonna be a great hour of history and I'm excited for it. But what I want you to do is I want you to flip in your Bible, go back to Exodus 15. Now we just read Revelation 15 I want to go back to Exodus 15. Now, two days ago, we talked about the response of judgment, meaning what does God's people do in response to judgment, where you cry out and praise and worship. We already talked about that based out of Revelation 19, where it says, Alleluia, Lord God omnipotent reigneth. It's a powerful verse in the Bible. Alleluia, or where you get the word hallelujah, is four times in the Bible, and it's all in the book of the Revelation. Revelation 19. So it's a, it's a direct response to what God is doing against the harlot. The angel says, let me show you the judgment of the great whore. Well, in Revelation 15, it says, they sang the song of Moses. Well, what is this song of Moses all about? I was going to teach on this yesterday until the Lord uh, brought us into teaching division. I believe that message needed to go forth. But I want to explain this, this part in Exodus chapter 15. So go there with me. And let's just start reading. Let's read Exodus 15 for a minute. 
and then we'll explain it for just a second and we'll, we'll run out of time and we'll finish today then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake saying I will sing unto the Lord for he hath triumphed gloriously the horse and the and his rider hath he thrown into the sea the Lord is my strength and song and he has become my salvation he is my God and I will prepare him in habitation my father's God and I will exalt him the Lord is a man of war the Lord is his name Pharaoh's chariots and his host has he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also were drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumest them as stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright as in heat, and the depths were con congolated in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, my hands shall destroy them. Thou didst blow with, the, with thy wind, the sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretchest out thy right hand. The earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in the strength unto thy holy habitation. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold of the habit inhabitants of Paliana. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed, and the mighty men of Moab, trembling, shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm, they shall be as still as stone. Till, the peop till thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over, which thou hast purchased. Thou shalt bring them in, and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in, the pl in thy place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in. In the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots, and with his horsemen into the sea. And the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tremble in her hand. And all the women went out after her with trembles and with dances. And Miriam answered, saying, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and, the, and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now you can keep reading because the next thing that happens is bitter water becomes sweet water, and then you see the provisions of God take place, which we talked about in our series, Provision and Obedience, Walking in Purpose, and Transition with God. How we talked about the fact that God removes captivity from off of your name using uh, bread and flesh, quail and manna. That's Exodus 16. That's the next chapter. But let's stay focused on Exodus 15 for just a second. We read 22 verses. You might say, Cody, why, do we, why did we read so many verses? Now, Exodus 15 is what takes place after Exodus 14. You might say, okay, that's super simple but you need to remember what happened in exodus 14. in exodus 14 god takes the children of israel through the hand of moses through the red sea and then moses gets to the other side and pharaoh is chasing them through the red sea and moses lets down the rod and the red sea comes together and it kills pharaoh and his entire army now we are very antiquated with the the Jesus of Christmas a lot a lot of people know the the Jesus of Christmas you know or the the um, 
the Jesus of Easter. You know, that's that's the type of Jesus most of us think about when they think about the Lord. But Jesus is the the captain of the host of God's army. I mean, that's who he is. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. It says in Revelation chapter 19 that Jesus comes on a white horse whose name is faithful and true to judge and make war. His, his vesture is dipped in blood. And that blood is not the blood of Calvary. That's the blood of his enemies that he kills. The Lord is coming back and will kill all of them that oppressed God's people. All of them that partook with the Antichrist. That's what, Jesus is not coming back as the peace and goodwill. He's coming back as a man of war so that he can make peace and goodwill on the whole earth. You cannot have peace and goodwill on the whole earth until you've had war. Until you've had the man Christ Jesus show up and destroy evil from off the face of the whole earth. That's the point that it's making. But I want you to see that you have just seen millions of people come through the Red Sea and Pharaoh's entire army is killed. And what is the response? What's the response to God's judgment? They start singing the song of Moses. They start praising out loud and crying out to God. O oh Lord, who is a God like thee? O oh Lord, who is like thee? Glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. It's a response of immediate praise and crying out and glorifying the God of Israel. The one that just killed the people that have enslaved them for 400 years. And God destroyed them in the Red Sea. Delivered His people. And they cried out in praise and worship. The part that always makes me laugh about this story is Miriam, which is... Moses is an Aaron's sister. We talked about her for a second yesterday, but but Miriam grabs a tremble and starts praising God and dancing. Could you imagine? You just you just watch millions of people die, and she grabs a little tambourine and starts smacking it around and dancing. Now like, this is real, and all the women start doing it with her. What type of man is like our God? I, we're talk we're out of time, but. I just want you to think about the song of Moses and the response of God's people when we're on the sea of glass with harps singing out this same song for the God of Israel who destroys wickedness from off the face of the earth. God, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, I love you. God bless you. Have a great day, and we will see you tomorrow. The sparrows not worried about tomorrow Oh, the troubles to come Lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Because you take good care of me. The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the dark.